you're much welcome at Medical Sciences, where we want to discuss about infrared spectroscopy covered under pharmaceutical chemistry. So as we begin, we always urge you to subscribe if you haven't, and then like the video. Then share to many others so that they can continue to learn with us. So we have already completed the introduction to spectroscopy. We have looked at the UV visible spectroscopy. So in this session, we are going to zero on the infrared spectroscopy. And under infrared, we are going to see the wavelength. We are going to see the principle, the instrument, how it works. And then we shall conclude with the interpretation. So this infrared it is the one that follows UV light. As we remember in the introduction, if we have X-ray, X-ray is followed by the UV light then the visible, then we go to infrared. From infrared, that's when we go to the radio, to the television wave, then to the radio wave. So this is how they follow each other. And we know that UV is between 200 to 400, then visible between 400 to 700, 700. Then infrared is between 780 to 1 so this is the the range of the infrared 780 nanometer this is in nanometers so that is the infrared we are discussing in this session and this infrared the infrared spectrum it is responsible when it is passing through the sample. If you have infrared electromagnetic radiation, it passes through the sample or the solution. What happens, it causes vibration, can cause vibration or it can cause rotation. Rotation or vibration of functional groups of functional groups around their bond. So around their chemical bond, at the chemical bond, at their chemical bond, we are going to see vibration and rotation of functional groups around their chemical bond. And this vibration and rotation caused by the infrared on the sample, and this sample, it absorbs only infrared, which is at the same, they must be at the same frequency. The frequency, only the, the component or the organic substance in the sample to absorb the infrared light, they should be at the same frequency. So when they are at the same frequency, so if the sample, the component in the sample absorb at one hertz, even this light which is absorbed should be at one hertz. So they must be of the same frequency so that they can be absorbed. So when this infrared has passed through the sample, after reaching the sample, the principle says when this infrared reaches in the sample in the chuvette or in a sample cell, the components in the sample, they become excited after becoming excited, they are going to undergo vibration or rotation around their functional group. And this excitation of the sample produces either stretching. These two can produce stretching of the sample around the bond of the component, or it can bring about bending, bending due to rotation. And examples of the stretching in this position, we, we have what we call symmetrical and asymmetrical. So these are the two things that can happen under the stretching of the bond. For example, if we have a bond such as this one, what happened, this is formaldehyde, so this is the functional group. So this functional group can undergo stretching, that is upwards, 
or it can stretch downwards. Then also it can undergo bending. It can bend either in anticlockwise or it can bend in this position. And under bending, we can have what we call, there is what we call twisting. They can undergo twisting. They can undergo scissoring. They can undergo scissoring or they can undergo locking. And another one is wagging. So these are the different forms of the bending of the functional group around its chemical bond. That when a substance in the sample absorbs infrared light, these substances in the sample, they become excited and they can respond by either stretching or bending. And we have seen stretching can either be symmetrical, that is, they are bending, they are stretching in the same, in the same position. If I have a functional group like this, hydrogen, hydrogen. So we are meaning the stretching, these hydrogens can stretch in the same direction. That is what we are calling symmetrical. So this is symmetrical. But when they are bending in opposite direction, the one is coming this side and another one is going this side, this one we call it asymmetrical. So we are seeing symmetrical stretching is whereby the functional groups on, the, on, the, on their bonds stretch in the same direction. When they are stretching in the same direction, that's what we are calling symmetrical. But if one is stretching in this position and another one is going backwards, we are calling it asymmetrical. And as we know that the major application of infrared is to identify components by determining their functional groups. So it is majorly used for identification of functional groups within compounds, especially organic compounds. That is its application. So don't forget that application for identification of compounds by identifying their functional group, depending on their behavior when they are excited with infrared light. So we have seen, we have explained symmetrical, stretching in the same direction, then asymmetrical, stretching in the opposite direction. But another example like for bending, if we have a component that it's, this is its chemical bond, then it is having some functional group at this point. Maybe it has the H here, and this one also has the H here. So we are meaning they can, bo they can bend. And when, when they twist, twisting is whereby they are, they are turning. It comes and turns around the bone. That is what we call twisting. But about scissoring, scissoring occurs if I have a bond here, and this is the functional group, H, H. Scissoring is whereby they are moving like a scissor. So if I have a scissor and it's cutting, they cut across, and they are moving in the same direction. That is what we call scissoring. So scissoring is whereby they are cross-cutting each other at about its bond. So if this is the bond, scissoring is that they are moving in the opposite direction, forming a scissor-like shape. That is the bending we are calling scissoring. Then locking, locking is whereby they are turning at the V, they are making a V turn. If this is the bonds. They are making a V turn, but they are moving at not at the same time. So they are moving in the same direction, but at a different intervals. That is what we call rocking. They are undergoing locking. Then wagging is whereby if this is the bond, one is moving in this direction and another one is moving in this direction, 
about their bond. That is what we call wagging. They are wagging at their position at the bond, the chemical bond. So this is how different functional groups behave when they become excited after being after absorbing UV, or what we are no after absorbing infrared light. That they either respond by stretching or bending. Stretching can be symmetrical, that is in the same direction, or asymmetrical, that is in the opposite direction. So we said here they are stretching in the same direction, then here it is in the opposite. Opposite one this side, another one moving this side. That is, then we have seen bending, you either to twisting, scissoring, locking, or wagging of functional groups about their chemical bond. So, after seeing this, now this is going to lead us into the principle, which we have already summarized, that if I have a source of light, if this is a bulb, and this bulb is producing light, it's going to pass through a slit, a slit is preventing stray light from reaching the monochromata, then this monochromata, this is the slit, this is the light source. So, and here we have the sample, then we have the photo detector, then we shall have the readout. So, we are seeing when light is passing through the slit to strike the monochromata, this is going to split, this light in two spectra of light, then we are going to have the monochromatic infrared reaching the sample within the sample hole. And when it reaches there, if you find their compounds, and these compounds which can absorb infrared, we say that they can only be, the light is only absorbed when it have the same frequency when they have the same energy and the same frequency. So if this infrared light strikes the sample in the chuvet and find their components which have the same vibration or which have the same wave number or the same frequency, they are going to be absorbed and others are transmitted. Then when the, the transmitted light reaches the photodetector, reaches on the detector, which is the D detector. And at the detector, its the function is always to convert light energy to electric energy. And this electric energy is going to be produced on the readout on the screen. This is the readout, whereby we can form a certain, we can produce a certain graph. And so forth. So this is the readout which we get on the galvanometer. So this, the principle behind infrared, we are saying that when the light, a monochromatic light, because this one also obeys B. Lambert's law, that when this monochromatic light passes through the sample containing components of the same frequency, that that light, the infrared light, is absorbed by the components in the sample with the same frequency. Then those ones with different frequency, they are transmitted. Whereby example we said here, that if the sample components, there is one which is at one hertz, it has to absorb, it has to absorb the light of the same frequency that is one hertz. If it is two, it cannot be absorbed by the sample, it is transmitted. So, then, so of the same frequencies absorbed, whereas the remaining is transmitted, which is converted into electric energy and is displayed on the readout. And we say that during the light or the infrared passing through this sample, when these molecules absorb the infrared light, they become excited. And when they are excited, they can respond by causing stretching or bending of the functional groups 
and different functional groups stretch and bend in different ways. So that's how we are able to identify that maybe a function is an alkyne or is an alkane, or it is having the hydroxyl group, or is having a carbonyl group, because they stretch and bend differently. That's how we are able to identify. So this is the principle you can talk about infrared. I can, in the summary, the principle that when infrared light passes through the solution, part of its light is absorbed by the components of the same wavelength. Whereas those ones with a different wavelength, they are transmitted, which reaches on the detector and converts into electric energy, which is displayed on the readout in the form of a graph. That is the principle behind infrared. And we want to continue to expound more on the graph. If I can zoom this graph, we're going to see that this graph Here we have what we call wave number. This one, we have the wave number measured in a reciprocal of centimeter. Then here we have percentage transmittance. Then it can be zero, it can be 50%, it can be 100%. Then wave number here begins at 4,000, we go to 3,000, and go to uh, 1,500, 1, and go to 1,000, then we have 500. The, the units is a per centimeter. That is what we are calling the reciprocal of centimeter. That is the unit of the wave number and what is the at this point we should be knowing the relationship between wave number and wavelength for example the wave number which is denoted by mu bar that is is equal to one of a wavelength that is lambda so if i have the wave number i can easily get even the wavelength whereby wavelength if i Make a reciprocal wavelength is equal to one divided by wave number, which is denoted by mu bar. So that is the relationship. So I can easily convert this one into wave number. For example, we know that this 400, to get the wavelength, wavelength is equal to one divided by 400, 4,000. And this one gives us 2.5 microns. 2.5 microns. This one becomes the wavelength. Or you can call it, this is microns, or you can call it 2,500. So this is the, the wavelength we can. So to determine the wavelength, wave number is equal to 1 divided by the wavelength. So that is the formula you can use to convert them. And also for transmittance, if it is in the percentage, absorbance is equal to 2 minus log 10. Transmittance, percentage transmittance. This is also another formula we can employ to determine the, the, the absorbance if we are given this. So on the graph, what happens is that when the infrared light is passes through the sample. If it does not contain a component of the same frequency, it is not going to be it is not going to be absorbed. It is transmitted. So it will be at a hundred percent. It will be having a hundred percent transmittance, but it reaches a point whereby some of the infrared light is absorbed. So at this point, there is some infrared being absorbed. Then if it means a compound of the same wavelength, of the same frequency, it is going to be absorbed. It is absorbed. And after being absorbed, 
forms this diffraction, then it goes back when there is no point component of the same wavelength. Then when it meets another component of the same wavelength, it's going to be diffracted again, and it forms this component. Whereby we can have this one also formed. If it meets another one, it can form the sharp one. It continues making men. But the ones this side we don't between between 1500 we can split this graph into two whereby this side from 4000 to 1500 we call it diagnostic region this is the diagnostic region whereas this one is the fingerprint region this is the fingerprint region which we cannot interpret its graph because each component in the sample behaves different. So here you cannot find any component having the same graph because this is how we can even distinguish components or substances by using fingerprinting region. But here at, in our discussion, we're interested in the diagnostic region. And in this diagnostic region, which is, which is moving from wave number 4000, to, to 1,500. That is what we are calling the diagnostic region. And we are going to see that when infrared strikes components which have a single bond, like maybe CH or C or H, these ones, because they have a single bond, they vibrate at a faster rate. So they have higher frequency and higher wave number. So for them, they absorb light at a higher wavelength, at a short wavelength, because they have higher frequency. So an example is like this diffraction or this absorbance of light here, because we see transmittance, percentage transmittance is low. So this light could be have been absorbed by a component like having the hydroxyl group, like COH. It is the one that forms this diffraction because they are absorbed at a higher frequency or at a short wavelength because they have a single bond around, the, uh, around their chemical bond. So this is one example. But for saturated compounds, saturated compounds, for them they produce some V, the shape is V. If I have a component which is saturated like C, H, this one forms a diffraction which is in this form because it is saturated. So, and these, these ones with a single bond, they absorb light between 4,000 to 21,000. Well, that is the wave now. Then for the triple bond, components with a triple bond, for example, C, N or C, C, these ones absorb between 21,000 to 19,000. to 1,900. Then those ones with the double bond, for example, C, C, that is, these are alkenes, it is between 90, uh, 1,900 to 1,500. So these are the different wave numbers of different samples. So this is why we are saying we can use this one to identify which functional group is in a compound. Then this graph can represent the carbon carbon. Carbon in the sample having the carbon carbon this one produces a sharp diffraction. This is different from the hydroxyl group. This one produces a sharp diffraction. And as we said, components with a single bond, they are absorbed at a higher frequency and at a higher wave number. Then these ones, they are, they are absorbed. Those ones with the triple and the double bond are absorbed 
at a longer wavelength, or you can call it at a, a, short, at a, a smaller wave number, or at a shorter wave frequency. That is what, because we know that wave number is directly proportional to frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the wave number. That is what we should be known. So this is what we can discuss in this session about infrared spectroscopy, whereby we have started by looking at uh, the, the range where we find the infrared, that is after the visible spectrum. We have seen that when infrared strikes components in the sample, they become excited and they can undergo vibration and rotation. And when they undergo vibration or rotation, that's why infrared spectroscopy, we can even call it rotational spectroscopy. So when this infrared strikes the sample, the bonds or the functional groups in the sample, they become excited. If they are of the same frequency, they become excited after absorbing the infrared light and they respond by either stretching or bending. And we said this, then the ones with the different frequency, they are transmitted to the photodetector and converted into electric energy, which is displayed by the graph on the readout, which we have expounded more by looking at the percentage transmittance and then on the x-axis having the wave number. And even we have seen the relationship between the wave number and the wave length. And we have said that single bond, components with a single bond, they are absorbed at a higher wave number or at a higher frequency. Whereas followed by the triple bond, then lastly, the double bond. And we have seen the application is for identifying functional groups in components. If we have a sample which we don't know its functional group, we can easily classify it by doing infrared spectroscopy so that we can identify the type of functional group in that organic component so that we can easily identify and quantify the components. So thank you so much for learning with us. We are always privileged to serve you. May God bless you.